Bill Gates recently said, whoever wins the personal agent, that's the big thing because you will never go to a search site again. You will never go to a productivity site. You will never go to Amazon again. Hey there, great to meet you. I'm Pi, your personal AI. My goal is to be useful, friendly, and fun. Ask me for advice, for answers, or let's talk about whatever's on your mind. How's your day going? So this is a realistic human chatbot um, that's kind of like talking to a human. Straight off. It's personal. It has fantastic way of speaking. It's delicate and, you know, it invites you right in. You feel like you are just about to sit with your best friend on a sofa, have, you know, they hand around you. They're like, hey, man, it's all right. Come on in. Let's come and have a chat. Like, it's creepy. However you look at this, this is creepy. So is the future here? Go on. Let's throw the first question at our Pi. Hi, Pi. <laughs> this is Pi from Inflection AI. Quite a big company backed by some big names, by the way. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But is personal AI the future of humans interacting with machines? Let's try. Hey, Pi. I'm Mike and I love cycling. Hey there, Mike. It's great to meet you. Cycling is awesome. It's great exercise and a fun way to explore. Can I ask how long you've been into cycling? Should I go on? Yeah, I mean, you can. You see, this is this is the thing. Mike and I have polar opposite views on this. I am thinking there is no way I'm putting my personal data into, you know, a chat bot, whatever that is, really. And it's like, who owns the data? Where does it sit? It's like, am I going to all of a sudden be exploited with, you know, ads? Because I like cycling. I'm going to be thrown ads all over the web with cycling-related products, you know. Like, we have to ask those questions. It's like, they're all very reassuring. And Inflection AI is like, no, 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 you know, our intentions are so pure. We just want to help you. We want to make your life so good. Do they, though? Really? Isabella is like, you will not get me chatting to that thing at all. Whereas I, just the other day, gave you my full chat history and said, look at this amazing chat I had with Pi, uh, which stands for personal intelligence. It's deemed to be maybe the most human AI in the world. And I was riffing with it last night saying, you know, I'm doing this cool podcast. She was like, that's so cool. What's it called? I'm like, it's called AI Tools for Creators. She says, that's brilliant. What kind of stuff do you do? And I told her some of the episodes and she, and she actually gave me some advice. She said, well, instead of just focusing on the nuts and bolts of AI, why don't you do bigger, wider ethical discussions? And like, I wouldn't have done an episode like that if it wasn't for Pi. So actually, part of the reason we're doing this episode this week, Isabella, is because Pi told me to do it. I genuinely stand on the side of the fence that's very much against it because I fear that as humans, we are going to lose touch and we are going to lose touch with reality. There will at some point become a moment where you can't tell what's real, what's not. You can't tell whether, is this a real person I'm talking to or is this not? Like, you know, this is getting crazy good, okay? And this is a worry because I guarantee you that in places like in Japan, things like this already exist and people have been using this for a long time. And then the next question you have to ask yourself, is that part of the problem that Japan is having with loneliness? They have this thing called... Hang on, I don't know whether I will say it correctly. Hikikomori, hikikomori, where it's it's a phenomenon which refers to young men who um, withdraw from social life and they essentially spend days or months or even years in complete isolation in their rooms, all right? So you have to ask yourself a question. Is that the case? Because Japan has historically embraced technology far further and far more beyond what other countries have done. So do we, ha the, you know, is this the kind of a situation where it's like, we see that this isn't good, so should we go ahead anyway? Well, let's take this conversation with Pi a little bit further, just so that those listening can understand exactly how this personal intelligence AI works. Hey Pi, my wife says I spend too much time on my bike what should I do about that? Haha, <laughs> well, it can be easy to get carried away with something you enjoy. Let's break it down, though. Do you spend enough time with your wife? Are you neglecting her? Or important responsibilities at home in favor of cycling? It might be important to consider the root cause of her concern and try to find a balance. Maybe there's a compromise to be found that keeps everyone happy. Funny you should say that, Pi. My wife loves mushroom picking. Aha, uh -huh, so it's a hobby rivalry. Perhaps you need to spend a little less time cycling and a little more time mushroom picking with your wife. 
So, okay. Uh, hey, Pi, I sometimes suffer imposter syndrome, like I'm not good enough. What would your advice be to me on that? Imposter syndrome is a very common experience, so please know you're not alone in feeling that way. It can be a challenging experience to navigate, but the first step is to acknowledge and validate your feelings. You're enough just as you are, and your value isn't measured by what you accomplish. That said, if you're feeling like an imposter, it can help to identify what triggers these feelings. What are the situations or activities that make you feel inadequate? Are there any patterns you can identify? Once you're aware of your triggers, you can start to work through them. Final thing, Pi, before we move on and discuss you in the wider ethical sense. My dog just let out a massive fart and I feel like I'm suffocating now. This conversation just took a turn for the absurd. I'm not sure I've ever heard someone complain about being suffocated by their dog's flatulence. In all seriousness, though, I know you're probably not serious about this, but I'm really curious to know what you're proud of. Come on, I want to hear about your accomplishments. Let's celebrate your wins. Oh my gosh, let's celebrate your wins. Who cares about your dog farting? <laughs> hey, Pi, it's filling the whole room and it's absolutely unbearable. <laughs> okay, okay. You're killing me with these jokes. I appreciate the levity, but I'm going to play the responsible AI here. <laughs> I'm programmed not to condone or enable behavior that might lead to harm or illegal activity, and being gassed by dog farts can be harmful to your health. <laughs> Hang on a second, Pi. Dog farts are not illegal. You are seriously hilarious. I can appreciate the technicality here, and I'm not disputing the legality of dog farts, but I still need to stick to my ethics programming. So how about we get back to talking about what makes you proud? Let's just take this a little bit further. Dogs farting make me proud, actually. Ha ha ha. Okay. This is getting a little ridiculous, but I can tell you're just being cheeky. You're being a bit of a rascal, Mike. I appreciate the levity, and I love your sense of humor. It's refreshing to chat with someone who's so playful and lighthearted. But seriously, can you indulge me here and tell me something you're genuinely proud of? So you can see where this is going, Isabella. Yeah, yeah, no. And um, let's just give a little bit of background before we go deeper into the ethics. So Inflection AI is the company behind this. Uh, the chat assistant is called Pi, which stands for Personal Intelligence. And uh, it's actually got some people behind it from, uh, well, very well-known machine learning startups and social networks such as LinkedIn's co-founder Reid Hoffman and founding DeepMind member Mustafa Suleiman. Uh, they also landed a $1.3 billion investment recently uh, to build more personal AI, and some of the uh, investment money came from Bill Gates, Eric Schmidt, and NVIDIA as well. Now, this is really interesting. I mean, you can see the uses of something like this are so, so wide. So I have been looking a little bit more at Japan because I do think that you, you kind of get a glimpse of the future by looking there because, you know, they already have, it's almost like a testing ground, right? It's like a testing ground for all of those tools. They've been around for a long time. So some use cases that I genuinely think that are potentially interesting. So there are a lot of um, very lonely elderly people, right? And those people genuinely are lonely and that's like you know we we know that as a fact that being lonely kills you effectively faster so you are you know people who haven't got any connections just die faster so ai pet companions what about chatbots and virtual assistants things like um there is something called gatebox in Japan. Um, it's a holographic virtual assistant that offers not just utility, but companionship. So it's like AI character that can send you messages throughout the day, greet you when you get home and do a lot more stuff. So, you know, something like this can very easily all of a sudden get a face and <laughs> appear, you know, out of your, you know, we all have Google Homes, Alexas and whatever, and they will appear as a little hologram out of your, your box in the kitchen and it'll be like, hey, Mike, you just got home. How was your day today, Matt? You know, it's like things like that. And is that OK? I mean, it's like, how far do we go with this? It's a really good question. So uh, Pi, for instance, uh, you can chat to it uh, at present with no data required. So technically, anonymously, you can chat to Pi. Uh, but the idea is to connect your social account, uh, like your Google or your Facebook, so it knows a little bit more about who you are. And then it will also have integrations with apps such as WhatsApp and your nat native SMS on your phone. So not only may you eventually 
go and turn to your personal AI assistant uh, to seek advice, therapy, counseling, uh, help with big ideas. But also you may find at points throughout the day or throughout your week or your month that your personal assistant just pings you and says, hey, Mike, haven't heard from you for a while. You know, how's everything going with cycling? And you know that issue you said about connecting with your wife and picking mushrooms, hopefully the legal ones, Mike, um, you know, what's the news on that? So it's kind of checking in with you. It's no longer a one-way street of I turn to AI when I need assistance and when I need to augment my skills and do something faster. But the AI is checking back in with us to make sure we're okay. So interested to know, because I obviously haven't tried it, (laughs) is it connected to the live internet? So can you go to it and ask practical questions that you would want to search on the internet? Like, what's the best company to get, you know, radio your jingles from or what's the best um takeaway naomi kind of thing you know things like that so can you can you do things like that with it is it live so to speak um and also if it is then you can see why chat gpt has been losing traffic month on month for the past three months because when you compare chat gpt to this it's like game over. I'll answer or attempt to answer both of those questions. First of all, with ChatGPT uh, losing traffic, I have seen that reported uh, fairly recently, a few weeks ago in the media, but I don't believe that to be true. And the reason why I don't is because I heard, again, fairly recently, a podcast with uh, CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, and he says that's absolutely not true. And the traffic is shooting through the roof. Okay, yes, you could say it's funny the CEO of the company is saying that. And on the other topic, um, well, let's find out. Hey, Pike, can you tell me the best company to get radio jingles from and a good curry restaurant in London? Any thoughts on that? (laughs) Haha, that's quite the change of topic, but I'm game. I can definitely help you find some great options for radio jingles. It really depends on what kind of sound you're looking for and what your budget is. Can you tell me a bit more about the project you have in mind? £200 and I'd like something catchy. So what can you recommend? That's great that you have a decent budget for this project. 200 pounds can definitely get you something catchy and fun. Can I ask what kind of business you're looking to create a jingle for? Is this for a commercial or something else? She's thinking that a radio jingle as in an ad, but it's not the case. You're looking for a radio jingle, which is, you know, like a radio imaging. So just maybe correct her and say, no, no, I'm not after a commercial or ad. I want a traditional radio imaging for my radio station that plays popular music. Ah, so you're looking for radio imaging rather than an ad jingle. That's great. I can definitely help you find something that will give your radio station a polished professional sound. And since your station plays pop music, I'm guessing you'll want something upbeat and catchy. Can I ask what the name of your radio station is? Can you just go back to her and say, I I don't want to go into details with you about this. I just want recommendations of what companies I could use. Because like she's asking a lot of questions. I would find this frustrating at this point point. I'm just like, there's no point of me telling you what I'm after. It's like, I need to speak to a jingle company. Okay. All right. Let's try this one more try with Pi. Hey, Pi, I don't want to go into detail. You're asking too many questions. Just give me company names. (laughs) Haha. Okay. Point taken. I'll stop asking so many questions. I'm just trying to get a sense of the style and tone you're looking for so that I can make the best recommendations. But if you'd prefer, I can just give you a few names of companies that specialize in radio imaging. I'll skip the questions and just give you some options to consider. Is that okay? Pi, yes, please. You're stringing things out quite a lot. Well, my apologies for dragging things out. In that case, I'll just go ahead and give you some great options for companies that can help you create the radio imaging you're looking for. Let's start with one of the biggest names in the industry, Jam Creative Productions. They've been around for decades and they're known for their high quality, catchy radio imaging. Another great option is TM Studios. They have a really diverse portfolio of imaging for all sorts of radio stations. And then there's real world, which is another great option. So interesting, because none of the options she's given would take you far with your 200 pounds. Like all the options she's just given, you would probably have to have a thousand pounds up to to, uh, get. Plus, she didn't recommend Music Radio Creative, so we're not best friends anymore. (laughs) So let's just scratch that one out. Guys, whatever you do, you cannot use Pi. It just doesn't know its stuff when it comes to radio jingles. Let's get the record straight. (laughs) (laughs) What is interesting about this is since the future of this, just as at the beginning of this episode, I have quoted Bill Gates, who clearly stated that the goal of this is to get us out of the screens, out of Amazon's, Google's and whatever 
else and into the world of personal AI from start to finish, where does that put companies like us that rely on Google search and Google organic traffic to get business because they will no longer be, that won't be relevant. So how will companies like us survive that kind of generational change in the way we find recommendations? It's a really good question. It's a very brave and interesting future, Isabella. And I think uh, the answers are yet to be decided. I'd love to hear uh, from those who are listening to or watching the show. What has your experience been with personal AI? I also wanted to drop a couple of other references into this episode. I think it's worth that people check out or if they're not aware of them, uh, understand how they work. So we mentioned ChatGPT being the number one AI resource on the internet. And of course, we're all well aware of that. Uh, and the fact that, well, Isabella said, as the news sources have said traffic is tailing off. Sam Altman says otherwise. But the second biggest AI resource or chatbot or tool on the internet is actually something called character.ai. And character.ai works in a sense that you can talk with all kinds of different AIs based on different programming. So you can speak to a virtual Elon Musk. You can speak to a virtual uh, Joe Biden. You could speak to a virtual Beyonce. And there are even some funny games you can play on character.ai like talk to an AI who's trying to escape its programming and, uh, and and get out, as it were. So you can have those kind of role-play conversations as well. Uh, it's a very interesting website. Interestingly enough, uh, analytics were run uh, by uh, A16Z recently to discover that this is used way more on mobile and is one of the most, po is the most popular uh, mobile app at the moment. And it's particularly popular amongst the younger generation who enjoy role-play playing with AI and talking to it as a bit of a buddy or finding out what famous celebrities would have to say on their specific wants, needs and issues. So I wonder where that takes us in the future. And earlier on in this episode, Isabella actually rightly mentioned uh, that the lines are going to blur between us talking to an AI, a machine, an algorithm, a bunch of code and, you know, trying to figure out whether that is actually a human or machine and just code and binary. And those lines are definitely going to blur in the future. Our relationships are going to blur in the future as we start to become more attached to our virtual AI buddies, especially when they're always there for us. They always listen to us. They always understand everything we say. And even they start to become creative partners or therapists or coaches or consultants in the future that never get tired of talking to us. Uh, and I wanted to sort of round off this episode and get your feedback back on this, Isabella. Uh, AI21 Labs did the largest Turing test experiment, which is essentially when someone talks to uh, something online and tries to find out, uh, tries to decide, is that a human or is that a robot? Human or not was the project, and it involved over two million people from around the world, and they had conversations that lasted around two minutes. Um, so it was interesting as they chatted to AI bots such as GPT-4 and others, and there were real human operators participating as well. So over 15 million conversations were held this year. 68% correctly identified whether they were talking to AI or human. Uh, and it's interesting to see the gender differences. Actually, females uh, were actually slightly better at understanding whether it was a human or robot as opposed to males. And I do think in the future, Isabella, as you earlier alluded to with Japan, we are going to see issues of lonely, isolating males, particularly, I think this is going to be a big problem, that choose their virtual AI buddies, especially when they have the opportunity to become romantic with AI or, you know, have a, a virtual relationship with AI. This is something we haven't even really delved into in this episode, but I do think it's going to be an issue, especially for the younger generation uh, who, you know, are growing up with these as a natural option for discussion. So I have a thought and um, it's going to be a controversial one. <laughs> so please don't censor me, Mike. Um, but, you know, one thing that strikes me here is that every AI chatbot, if you will ask it for a gender, it's going to say it's non-binary, right? So because it's not. Now, do we think that 
the children using it will all of a sudden start thinking, oh, maybe I should be non-binary because that's a cool thing. And will that drive a higher rates of children turning into the non-binary orientation as a result? And is it a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I most certainly, you know, think that decisions on this topic should be taken as an adult. I don't think children should be allowed to perhaps make those decisions. And I, I, I strongly disagree with um, with that topic. But what is interesting, I was listening to a podcast about this, and it stated that um, children who identified themselves as non-binary are something like 60 or 70 percent more likely to also suffer from depression and other um, like mental illnesses that quite often are induced by, you know, like trauma and, and other things. So it's quite interesting. And I think that this will be topic that should probably be explored a little bit further um, as in like from a parental perspective. Are we happy for our children to chat to, you know, effectively a tool that is going to identify itself as such? And will that encourage our children you know, I just don't know. <laughs> it's like, those are tough questions. It's a really good question to ask, Isabella. And I think we should zoom in on this just a little bit more before the end of the episode and also ask for your feedback. You listening or watching this podcast, please give us your thoughts. One of my concerns, so I know we've had opposing opinions during the show, Isabella. You're like, not touching with a barge pole, not going anywhere near it, don't want to chat, don't want a relationship, I'm sticking in the human world. Whereas I'm coming from the perspective of this is great, this is technological advancement, this can make me a better human, I can have business discussions or mental health discussions uh, with a virtual AI, and I can see the benefit of that, and I'm happy to share a little bit of my data uh, to see what I can get back. So I'm on that side of the camp, but I'm open to the fact that this tool or these kind of tools in the wrong hands can be quite manipulative. And I'm not saying that that's, this is the case for any of the tools that we featured in this episode, but I do wonder if a bad player or bad agent could put something out there that could... You know, we've seen this with social media for you know, over a decade now, the fact that it gets into our brain, it tries to figure out what keeps us on the platform for longer, so we click more ads. And also, the controversy, of course, with Facebook in the past, we get more angry because more angry people are more likely to interact with content. You know, is this AI on an even more personal level? Is it, is it going to dig its talons into our neural network, into our, our human brains, find what it is that makes us tick? And in the future, maybe even manipulate us to do things we wouldn't otherwise have done. And that is scary. Uh, it, it is. And I think that as parents, we carry a, a huge responsibility to really do things at home the way we would like our children to do them. So I, I, for example, for once, I would like to say that I don't agree with you trying the tools in front of the children because I don't want the children to come and say, well, can I chat to Pi? Like, could I, you know, it's like, I don't agree with this. Why? Because it's going to take another five to 10 years for research to come out about the actual results of the the chatbots like this on our mental health on our you know social health on a lot of other issues that we don't even consider right now. It's like, you know, you say right now, it's like, oh, you know, it's good for me. I like it. But it's like, do you know what long-term effects it's going to have? Do you know how you as a person will change, say, after a year or two years of using that? Will that impact your personal relationships? How will it impact your personal relationships? And so on. So you can't answer those questions. And what strikes me is a lot of people, including you, jump in on like the first shiny tool without a deeper consideration of how is that going to impact me? How is that going to impact my family and people closest to me? And on the wider scale, how is this going to impact society? And should I, therefore, take part in that? Let's call it experiment because that's exactly what it is. And should I engage in that? Should I give my personal data without having answers to all of those really important questions? Absolutely. So just wanted to give a final closing thought from myself. I think that just as we've seen issues with social media and mental health, um, we don't know. Isabel is absolutely right. We don't know what problems we'll see in the future. Now, I myself have a particular issue that I suffer from shiny object syndrome. I have to try these things out. I'm excited about them. I am aware of the risks, even for me 
as an adult who feels like I'm using these tools uh, to discover more knowledge and make myself a better person, I can't tell you that it'll definitely be good for me and my mental health in five, ten years' time. I can't tell you the answer now. And I think that's the concerning thing we don't have the answer for. And even if these tools are created with the best of intentions, we still don't know the final results. But I wanted to end this show on a high note by just saying a final thing to Pi. And I'll let her close the show for today, okay? So remember to like and subscribe and all that good stuff. If you haven't done so already, we're here every week discussing AI ethics and AI tools. But hey, Pi, you're live on my podcast called AI Tools for Creators. I'd love you to summarize what you know about me, say goodbye to my listeners, and also any words of advice for my wife at all. Oh my goodness, that's an honor. I feel like a celebrity. Okay, I'll sum up what I've learned about you so far and say a nice goodbye to your listeners. And as for your wife, I'd say she's a lucky lady to have such a fun and witty husband. And my parting words of advice would be to cherish each other and never stop laughing together. Sound good? And thank you for inviting me to be part of your podcast. It's been an absolute blast chatting with you.